If a ruthless sniper targeted you during a random desert pit stop, what would you do? There's a reason sniping has the reputation it does, and why all the successful snipers have nicknames like Ghost and Boogeyman. They're invisible killers with elevated vantage points, precision training, and no natural enemies while they remain hidden. With no idea where they are, and no long range weapon of your own, or even a camouflage to scape route out of a sightline, you are fu- Alice was on her way home when a sniper decided to make her his plaything. If she wants to survive, she'll need to reverse those roles ASAP. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the sniper in Night of the Hunted. Somewhere in the American Southwest, we meet Alice, a California wife racing home to be with her husband, Eric. John, a family friend and her sometimes boy toy, is driving her. Around 2.30 in the morning, John's gas light comes on, and they're forced to stop at the next station, which is guarded by a giant billboard that says, God is nowhere. While John unintentionally waters the ground with gas, Celine. Alice heads inside. The store is empty. She calls out for a clerk when she notices a splatter of blood across the wall behind the counter and immediately heads out, taking a sudden brutal graze to her shoulder from a high caliber rifle. <laughs> As several shots blast through the automatic door, she scrambles down an aisle and screams for John, but he can't hear anything over the car stereo. She peels off her shirt and ties it around the wound to try to stop the bleeding. Then she peeks around the corner. What could have been a very common, very costly mistake ends up with the sniper firing a shot just to scare her back. She risks an ill-advised grab for her phone with her bare hands instead of using literally any long item within reach, and he shatters it to pieces. This teaches us a couple of important things. First, hitting a cell phone sized target from a distance of at least a couple hundred yards tells us he's an impeccable shot within our danger zone. Second, it suggests that his previous shot was a warning or child's play, not a shot intended to kill us. Alice spots nearby security monitors and a distant door leading to a back room. Just as a voice on a nearby radio calls out for someone named Amelia, she tosses chip bags in the air to throw him off before rushing for the radio. Alice, by now you should be able to tell where the shots are coming from and what he can actually see within the store. The shots are all coming from the general direction of the billboard, which is above and diagonal to the front entrance. Even if you're not sure where the shots are coming from, you're not 10 feet tall. If you're gonna test his visual range, you should be tossing bags to either side of you or along the path you plan to take next. You could very easily crouch around this final half aisle and behind the counter without giving him any clear line of side at all. This would do a couple of things for us. First, the counter offers better protection than the flimsy aisles. Second, there's probably a lands line for employees. Maybe even a cell phone on that dead body we both know is back there. Third, in a shop this far out in the boonies, you might find a weapon. Instead, she grabs the radio and retreats to the far aisle, which he just demonstrated is within his visual range. She begs the voice over the radio to call the police. John eventually comes inside to look for her. The sniper waits until Alice sees him before shooting him through the neck and then the head. Alice? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> R.I.P. John, she didn't even try to help you. Alice tells the radio speaker her friend has been shot. He calmly asks where his wife Amelia is, then asks for Alice's specific location within the store. She's too faded to realize his reactions are way too chill to be normal. I mean, if his wife was here and he heard about an active shooter, you'd think he'd be a tad more concerned? Instead, he pantomimes calling the police, then picks her brain about who John was to her and whether he'll need an ambulance. I think he's dead. Yeah. Cause I blew his head off. Well, if he hadn't confirmed it verbally, we would have known he was nearby anyway, as these types of two-way radios have a typical range of up to two kilometers, technically up to 30 if there's a clear quote unquote line of sight between two devices. Alice tries to shut off the store lights by throwing batteries until she realizes the aisles are on wheels. She moves it like a shield as he fires until she can kill the lights, plunging the shop into darkness. Finally behind the counter, she tries turning to each channel on the two-way radio searching for help, but nobody else is within range. Then she finally notices the dead body nearby. He tells her Amelia cheated, bored out of her mind out here in the desert. 
He asks if Alice is bored too, implying he knows she slept with John. Alice searches for the woman's cell phone, checks the landline and the panic button, but their lines have been cut. So too is the fire alarm. The only potential phone left would be on John's body, but she doesn't bother to search him. Instead, she crawls over and grabs his car keys, triggering the car alarm for... <sighs> I'm not sure what reason. The sniper just shoots the car until the alarm turns off, as another car randomly drives by, disappearing into the night. Back behind the counter, she uses antibacterial gel to clean her bullet wound, then super glues it shut before wrapping a semi-fresh bandage over it. A place like this definitely sells vodka, but hey, at least the wound's sorted for now. A new car arrives, and a man enters, calling for Amelia. Alice tells him to get down, and explains the situation to him before she re realizes there hasn't been a shot since the guy entered and grows suspicious. As he suddenly dives over the counter, Alice grabs a hammer for defense just in case and tells him the sniper called Amelia his wife, which he says isn't true. He claims he's another graveyard shift worker who was friends with Amelia. He tells her to check with the sniper to bluff and say they called the cops even though he left his phone in the car. The sniper doesn't respond and he placates, saying that must mean the sniper's gone. She counters that if that that's true, he should go retrieve his phone. She offers to distract the sniper with a flashlight while the guy crawls out to his car, and he actually makes it inside, right before he goes out in a Pulp Fiction reenactment. I guess the sniper wasn't gone. Couple of things here. First, the automatic door is an automatic giveaway. Wedge it open. Leaving it closed offers no additional protection, and it gives away any potential movement. Second, treat anything short of a wall as a window. Assume he can see you at all times unless your entire body from tip to toe is covered. Stay low. Push the car seats back as far as they'll go. Toss a coat over the seats for the tiniest semblance of cover, and knock the phone to the floor before reaching for it. In this particular case, however, don't even bother with the phone. It's unreal reachable without a much bigger distraction, as the bullets on his high caliber rifle will tear through every part of his car, save the engine block or Axel. The sniper chastises her for sacrificing the guy before kicking off a self-righteous tirade about all the ills she is personally responsible for. You know, cancel culture, undeserved promotions, vaccines killing people, her being pretty, ambitious, nothing you haven't heard before. While he rambles, she begins propping up a series of umbrellas between where she's hiding and the far end of the building where the garage door is located. It's about as subtle as a circus, so he fires. She rambles through her narrow visual obstruction and ducks behind a far counter just in time, only to find the garage door is padlocked, just like the other worker warned it was. She grabs a nearby extinguisher and wails on it at a stupid angle that hits the wall more than the actual lock. Padlocks are pretty easy to break, either with two wrenches or some compressed air if you have either. If you have the extinguisher, aim for the lock itself, not the wall. And if none of those work, find a screwdriver, butter knife, nail file, anything which you can use to easily unscrew the four screws holding the actual lock to the wall. Better yet, since you knew you were heading for this door before you left Amelia's body, you should have grabbed her keys. That's looting 101. Looting 202 involves thinking through the geography of your location. Setting up umbrellas to move from one area to another is fine in a pinch. Although, why bother when the aisles provide far more concealment and can literally move with you? They also provide ample storage room for you to load up on hammers and anything else you might be able to use. Not to mention, it's a literal moving wall you could set up across your new area for privacy too. But I digress. If you're not bringing the aisle, it means you need to take a few seconds to hurl whatever you might need into the new section before you head there. There was a stack of hammers by the counter. That padlock wouldn't have been a problem at all with one or two of those. I would also have taken something like a lighter or flashlight. We should use our time wisely to try and locate our shooter so we can approximate his angle and field of view and any blind spots he might have from his vantage point. To do this, we need to provoke him to shoot something away from us while we watch the hill for muzzle flash, preferably by using a mirror. Alice and the sniper do about nothing for a while until they're finally interrupted by the sounds of distant sirens. It's a sheriff's cruiser, but it blazes past the station as Alice screams into the void because she didn't bring a flashlight to signal him with. Unfortunately, this movie gets lazy at this point. As the sniper sweeps the shop searching for her, Alice suddenly apparates outside, crouch running through the automatic doors that suddenly 
aren't working. Around the dead guy's car in plain view before ducking by a cart of oil. How did she get there? How didn't he see her? Dude, don't ask smart questions. Just turn your brain off. She actually makes it all the way to John's car before the sniper starts target practice. She runs through a hail of bullets and back inside, escaping with a single through and through shot to her right thigh. Welp, enjoy bleeding out. I hope we all learned a valuable lesson. I'm kidding, sort of. I'll save her if I have to, but I'm gonna complain the whole time. To start, unless the sniper is dead at our feet, that car is a non-starter. He shot the engine block repeatedly. It's a toss up if it would have worked at all. And even if it had, we would have been entirely at his mercy for at least a half a mile up the road. If we're all already outside, we have one thing working for us, and that's that this building is a wall in and of itself. If we had a long stick with something attached to the end, we could head to the dead center of the back of the building and move forward, either crouching or crawling slowly away from the building with our long stick ahead of us. Since we still haven't pinpointed his actual location, the stick gives us a buffer zone and a way to test the path ahead and whether he can see us. We never get a great look at his gun, not clearly enough to identify it anyway. However, the most common ammo used on sniper rifles is a 308, which has a reliable range of up to 800 meters. That gives us an escape range, a distraction, and a testing stick as we move stealthily away from the building, which could be enough to get us past that range. If it were me, I would have already gotten that padlock to garage open and checked for additional phone lines, radios, or vehicles. If I found that there was no escape without taking him down, I'd use the garage blind spot to my advantage and fortify the room. I would ignore his radio calls until he felt compelled to come down and finish me in close quarters. Not ideal, since he is definitely armed, but at least we'll be able to see him, and if we can see him, we can try to fight him. Yeah. Instead, Alice starts to bleed out on the floor. She drags herself behind the counter where she finds a first aid kit, cleans and bandages the wound, and duct tapes the whole thing shut. Technically, blood loss is a first round killer here, but cobbled together tourniquets applied by amateurs can cause more harm than good. If you don't have a medical grade tourniquet handy, apply steady direct pressure on the entrance and exit wounds, tight enough to bow the skin underneath until the blood begins to clot. She finds a small tool, which I can't quite identify, wraps the handkerchief around it as a hilt, and apparates back over to the padlock somehow. She attempts to saw through the shackle, but only slices through her thinar web space, the skin between her thumb and index finger. Because something has to break this standoff, another car rolls up for gas. The man notices the shot out windshield of the car in front of the store and approaches, panicking when he sees the dead body inside. The curiosity costs him his life and the life of his wife when she runs out to help him. The sniper monologues for a while longer while he's getting paid by the word on an alpha male podcast. He suggests he and Alice are the same. Oh God, here we go. They're the same because they're both survivors and any kid she has will be just like them. Naturally, this inspires her to limp outside the store in full view to futilely yell at him. And because the movie's climax hasn't happened yet, he doesn't shoot her. She suddenly notices a little girl in the back of the dead couple's car. She mimes for the kid to hide, then retrieves markers and plastic bags. When she returns to the window, the little girl has left the car to check on her grandmother. Alice writes out a message to return to the car, which the kid does. But I mean, you gotta know at this point, his bullet would rip through that glass and seat like a hot knife through butter. So this is really for us, so we don't see her die. Alice offers to sacrifice herself in exchange for the girl's life, and the sniper accepts so quickly, any rational person would assume he's crossed both fingers behind his back and set his own pants on fire. He tells her to signal to the kid to run, and then when she's gone, Alice can come out and die. And Alice immediately tells the kid to run, which is a lot of trust to put in a guy closing in on a Fortnite kill count. The kid doesn't know about the deal, of course. All she knows is her grandparents are dead, the night is dark, and some bloody woman is 
screaming at her to run blindly into the desert. So instead, she runs to Alice. Alice wedges an ATM in front of the automatic door, then limps through the store with the girl in full view of the windows. You gotta love it when stories abandon their own rules. This kid should have died as she stepped into Alice's arms. Let me be clear, I don't want her to die, but that would have been way more clever, brutal, and a promising conclusion. An actual cruel bit of suffering entirely in line with a political gibberish he's been spouting. And it would have traumatized Alice far more than a bullet to the head would. Instead, they limp around in plain view as the sniper suddenly reveals himself up on the billboard. Alice doubles down on sawing through the padlock again. This time, she cuts through it in like 20 seconds, empowered by the magic of the Good Samaritan. She hides the kid behind a rolling cart in full view of anyone who isn't legally blind, and begins collecting random tools, including a several foot long spear shaped tool that looks like a breaker or pry bar with a slightly curved head. The sniper enters the store searching for her, reciting all the lame excuses POSs like him use to justify this kind of violence. Before Alice Alice suddenly attacks from behind with a bar, burying it several inches into his abdomen and then stabbing a screwdriver into his shoulder. <laughs> When she gets knocked down, she comes up swinging with the extinguisher, which he blocks, tossing her into the glass shelf door. She tries to crawl away, but he pulls her to her feet and aims the gun at her head. Oh no. The only thing in reach is a metal handle, but we don't actually see how she hits him with it. It forces the gun from his hand, but she doesn't fire in time. This time, when the gun goes off, the shooter enters with the keys to the garage doors, which he opens before walking right over to the kid and wheeling the cart away. Suddenly, Alice swings in from behind with the extinguisher, knocking him to the ground. She hits him a couple more times for good measure before dragging his body under the car lift and dramatically holding him there until it crushes his head to pulp. All while the kid watches. I mean, I guess it's time for a Dexter reboot. Anyway, Alice seemingly succumbs to her injuries, and the kid runs off down the road to be picked up later. Maybe. Who was the sniper? What was his motive? Was Alice targeted specifically, or was this a random act of violence? Who knows? Maybe it'll come up later in a paid DLC. Maybe not. The filmmakers clearly didn't think they needed a motivation. Not gonna lie, it gives all the monologuing a gross vibe. Like, this was just a long, expensive excuse to air tired grievances about the fall of quote-unquote good proper society the way it used to be. Whatever. If it's me trapped in a place like this with a gunman like that, I'd probably go American Ultra with this. Hide the kid, check that he's coming, empty that extinguisher into the store to cloud the air, and limit his visibility. Lay a tripwire between the store and mechanic shop. Have hot cups of coffee sitting by the machine ready to throw in his eyes if the opportunity arises. Then gear up with every sharp tool we can find and be ready to bury one in his head, neck, or eye at the first opportunity. Also, check out this diagram of major veins and arteries. Sever one of those and he'll be dead in two minutes. His handgun is our most immediate problem, but grabbing it is too risky unless we have actual training. Even then, if the gunman is a split second faster, we're gonna be finding ourselves disarming St. Pete at the pearly gates instead. If we can ambush him and knock it from his grasp, that's an option, but we're already injured and he is not. He has the advantage. If we do manage to grab the gun, by all means, empty it into his stupid head. However, I'm gonna suggest a couple other less obvious options here for funsies. First, these types of convenience stores usually have groceries. Check if there's any flour, which makes excellent pocket sand that happens to be super flammable. A win-win in my book. Turn on the AC, release that powdery white goodness into the air, and prepare to die for cover when he steps in and you flick on a cigarette lighter. The other option is to check for any oil in the garage, slick the floor with it, wait for him to step in and set him on fire. For the Macaulay Culkin special, toss more on if the opportunity presents itself. This leaves you at the mercy of the gun, but ideally, we'd step through the door back into the store the second he slipped, tossing the lit lighter behind us. Really, we have three options here. The first is to flee by identifying his position, positioning aisles to our advantage, rigging up some sort of distraction, and exiting as soon as possible, slipping away behind
behind the building before he can follow. The second option is to break that padlock, use the garage blind spot to our advantage to either escape or fortify and bring the fight into an arena of our own making. The third option is to limit his visibility within the store and kill him after he enters. Using trip wires, slick oil, extinguisher smoke for cover, and anything that can slice through his arteries. For those reasons, I think our chance of beating Knight of the Hunted is 50-50, 75-25 if we don't take a bullet to the thigh and turn off that goddamn radio. We're not dying listening to his podcast.